Richard's 87, and he was born in 1923. He's had a full career. I hope for some of you here, when he was here the other day and had a chance to, to meet him, that's really a, a wonderful privilege. Um, he has the wry, dry uh, wit and um, thoughtfulness of his New Mexico upbringing. Um, he's a remarkably thoughtful person. Uh, it's wonderful to still have access to him. And um, I think that his, one of the things that's always fascinated me about his work, uh, in, in art world that's a lot about clever observation, is that there is nothing clever about the mysterious work of Richard Hartwater. It's a very genuine, heartfelt, um, and thoughtful expression of his engagement with the world. Um, I think many artists have that, but it's a real privilege to try to suss out um, what that pursuit is going to be for posterity. And it's very complicated, there's a lot of work, um, and it, already it's been fascinating. So let's get back to Richard. My title for this talk was going to be, I thought, Fuzzy Logic, Precise Object. But then I thought maybe that that was disrespectful to, to Richard, and it works the other way too. It's um, fuzzy object and precise logic. And in both cases, they ring true. So fuzzy logic is a scientific term for thinking around the edges. That's a rough translation. If there's a scientist I'm insulting you, I'm very sorry. But um, in fact, I think that relates a lot to how artists make art. It's thinking around the periphery of how we um, live in the world. And I think that's absolutely the case with Richard. What's remarkable about Richard as an artist is he's a remarkable craftsman. So he has the capacity um, to make things that really question um, very ordinary experiences we have with um, the world around us, our daily experience. Um, Richard has said in the past he wanted to make pictures we could touch and sculptures we could see. And um, to defy that right away, what we're going to do is hand this rubber out so that you don't go into the show and start touching everything. Um, the tactility of the materials that Richard used are really important to them. And um, if any of you were wondering, this hairy rubber stuff is really creepy. Um, <laughs> it's an awful material. And one of the things about Richard's work that's been interesting throughout his work, he's drawn, been drawn to what we consider awful. And um, in that, he was quite prescient. Um, because the art world, um, I assume that when you come into this show, if you didn't know Richard Archwater was 87 year old, you would think that another one of the 20 somethings who showed here in the contemporary made these objects. They have an absolutely contemporary, immediate feel to them. They're raw, they're full of discovery, they're unusual, they're kind of confounding as art objects, they're not necessarily friendly, um, and Richard is quite aware of that. Um, and one of the things that's fascinating me and makes me want to understand work is um, he became interested in photography as um, a precursor to sculptural and painterly activity long before it was popular in the art world. And um, he did that, I think, by his response to materials in the world um, rather than conceptual ideas. And this has been a great misdiagnosis of what he's been interested in over the years. I think he's actually really interested in the physical world. And I just so happened that photography worked as a good tool for him to, to create a new access point to those things. I'm starting this here with um, this photographic. Um, all of Richard's paintings are, are inspired by uh, newspaper uh, photographs and other photographs. Um, so he was born in 1923. Um, in the 40s, he went to Cornell. His father was a biologist. I think this is not incidental. I have to do a little more research. Um, but he grew up in a family who were close lookers, and that's how they understood the world, sort of subcellularly. And um, I think his works reacted to that. I think he learned to be a close looker from that upbringing. He was kind of a failed scientist. He went to Cornell, was there for a few years, and was drafted into World War II. He was wounded at the Battle of the Bulge. And now I just find this fascinating. And um, then he went back to Cornell and finished his degree. But while he was staying in Europe after his service in the war, and was recovering from his injury, he fell in love with this Austrian woman, Elfriede, I think. I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing it right. She, they married, and she went up to Cornell with him, and when he was graduating, she just looked at him one day and said, you know, I think you really should just be an artist. Now, thank goodness for that woman, because uh, he said he wouldn't have come to that conclusion himself. Uh, they moved to New York, and he started to take art classes at the studio 
school, um, Amade Ozenfant, a modernist from Paris, has was teaching, and Richard was a complete failure at it. So he dropped out of art school. He eventually did go back and study drawing at night, um, but they started a family and he needed a skill. So he studied under a furniture maker. And his first years were not in the high art world, although it's clear, and I'll show you some pictures, that he was aware of what was going on in the art world in New York at the time, and some of the issues that high artists were modeled. He was a furniture maker, and he was very devoted to it. He made very fine, high-grade furniture. Um, and he did that for about a decade, and he had a terrible studio fire, and his studio burnt, and it was a great economic crisis for him. And I think it was also a, an emotional crisis. And he went back, he started that studio again, and he went back to making furniture with beautiful, beautiful wood. And he said he became completely disgusted by it. That he every day worked with his hands with these materials that were really exquisite, but he began to feel disconnected. Um, before he was making furniture, he also worked as a baby photographer, which is why I showed you one of these very first paintings of his. And I will show you it at the end again with uh, a compatriot painting that he's doing now, which I think exemplifies the shift he's made. Um, Richard made these paintings, um, again, from photographs. They're highly, they're um, a surface with a representation on them, one that is adapted by the material that he painted on. So these early paintings are painted on cellotex, which is, um, a, more simply, it's sugar cane fibers floated on a paper surface. It became problematic because I think it was coated with asbestos. So they no longer manufacture it, but I'll get onto that later. But Richard got very interested in this material because in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, um, it was sort of the heyday of the effects of abstract expression. The, the personal expression was what an artist was expected to bring to the table in terms of the experience we have with art. And he didn't really want to serve that up. So this manipulated, expressive surface gave people that tactility. It was sort of like the fake. It was sort of the Jackson Pollock effect on a photographic image. And so Richard felt that by choosing to paint on this, he pretty much dealt with that expectation and could move along in terms of understanding what a picture like this might mean in the world. Another thing that's not incidental about even these very early pictures is that they have reflective frames. And you'll see that throughout in the slides, and that's a very simple, Richard wanted to draw the viewer into the painting to close the gap between the high art wall surface and them, and so you're usually reflected in these frames. We don't have one here in the show, but he's using the ground. They've got, they've turned from this metal into a very cheesy plastic that's reflected. Um, Richard used his skills as a furniture maker to then make objects that certainly looked like sculpture of some sort. And that in the tradition of what was going on in the New York art world, there was a lot of conversation about why can we not close the gap between what we see with our eyes and what we experience physically in the space in which we live. And so this object, which is a kind of a sculpture painting, it's three-dimensional, but it lives on the wall and on the floor. And many of the artists in New York at this time were dealing with this problem, using Robert Morris's using felt, um, let's see, Lee Morton is doing it by putting canvas on the wall with sculptural objects that relate, that are on the floor. So Richard's aware of the art world, but he's not connected with it. Um, at the same time, he goes back to dealing with his world, and he became fascinated um, with Formica. It becomes uh, material in the 60s, and he has it in his studio. And at that point, the Formica was just a wood grain, black and white, and he started to make hybrid objects that were pieces of furniture covered with formica. So rather than make something out of something really beautiful, he's making that of the mirror of an image. He's basically representing what you would expect that piece of furniture to have. This is a very early work with a portrait of himself on that cellotex. So again, it's not a very good picture. At least not the picture we would want. And the piece of furniture has been covered with a fake veneer painting. So, uh, so it's a sculpture, painted sculpture, and it's a sculpted painting. And um, it's pretty unsatisfying, actually. It all seems a little bit fake. And, um, and Richard's pretty pleased with that. Because something can be, um, something can be sent to 
Um, at this time, he's still got his furniture studio going, and he notices that when he leaves at night, the men who work for him are starting to sort of diss the objects that he's making. They, they uh, scuff them, they push them over, and they're angry because he's disrespecting the fur fine furniture tradition that they normally are working with, with to him to make something useful and beautiful. So he confronts the men in, in his workshop. He says, you know, what's going on? How do you feel about this? And they said, well, we want to use our skills to make something useful. And in Richard's mind, something that's useful is usually something we take for granted. We don't see it anymore. It just functions for us. And this, for him, becomes the way to define art. Art really is the useless. And um, he's interested in trying to make use his skills to make useless objects. They end up being very beautiful, but they're not what is expected. So the next piece in the trajectory or the progression of that painted furniture piece is this piece made out of formica grain. And um, it's very different in feel. It's hard-edged. It's cold. Um, it's not a friendly object. It's not a friendly sculpture. And it's actually a picture of an object, right? You are having a sense of a mirror from that yellow color. Um, and you have a sense of a piece of furniture, but the drawers don't open. It's, it's really a picture of something we expect to see keeping that place for us in the room. I got particularly interested in Richard's work a few years ago um, at Yale. This painting I saw it in a show in New York, and I wanted to buy it for Yale University. Um, it had been sold at the time. It later came on the market through London, and I immediately bought it for Yale. There are a number of reasons why this is interesting to me. Um, this is during George W. Bush's presidency. Um, Yale has an extensive collection of hundreds of portraits of what we call the Yale worthies, who are former students who go on to be presidents, governors, they are deans, they are masters of the colleges, and their portraits are everywhere on campus. And they exemplify the problem, in most cases, of why Richards would not make a straight portrait photograph. We completely ignore these people. They hang, the students throw actually knives into them in the dining halls, or they get splurged with food samples. And no one really sees the person who was meant to be venerated by this very straightforward portrait painting. Richard um, painted George W. Bush. Um, and at the same time, uh, he painted this painting of Bush. He painted a painting of Osama bin Laden and one of himself. And he sees them as three connected images. And that is, um, and he was interested in that. And for years, he actually told me he kept a piece of paper in his pocket that actually um, answered questions for him about these two paintings, and he threw them away. But anyhow, um, sort of that's an interesting image to think of an artist musing that literally was something, an answer they didn't have from some work that they made. Um, but that triumvirate of images um, says a lot to me because I, I sort of, I think in American culture we would think of Osama bin Laden on one end, George W. Bush in the middle, and maybe Richard on the end, other end. And I don't think that he thinks that way at all. He sees them as completely equivalent portraits of three people that he, one of whom he has more familiarity with, and two that he doesn't know at all. But it very ably represents how an image is something that we all project our understanding onto. And it really doesn't tell us anything about the person that's represented. Again, it's painted through the diffused image of a, a newspaper photograph. Um, it has the reflective mirror frame so that you can really get drawn into it when you're looking at it. And it has been a fascinating painting to have at Yale. The way that Richard works, there's no indication whether he's taken a lot of time to make this image, so it's not disrespectful. It is black and white, so it's very neutral. And we constantly talk with the students about what they, how they respond to this artwork. And we get the whole gamut of experience um, and response to it, depending on the, the student's personal beliefs. It's just a wonderful kind of uh, springboard for your ideas and emotions. And I think that's actually the traditional function in most cases for artwork. And um, Richard's been able to create an image that functions in that way. <coughs> This grew out of a series of paintings. Um, one of the things we're going to do in this exhibition is show a lot more of Richard's painting. But this is another early work that's in our collection at Yale that I think directly inspires a work like the art that George W. Bush portrait. And someone like Walter Cronkite is making this in 1963. He makes a compendium painting that's blank. Um, 
these paintings are six inches deep. They're only about this big, so they're really sculptural pictures. And um, I think they very boldly ask the question of like, what actually is the information and the factuality of what we're seeing on TV at this time? <laughs> so think of it as a very politically uh, confused time in American history, very specifically questioning the kind of um, leadership, uh, the information you're receiving over the news, um, again, Richard goes on to make more objects in Formica. He's fascinated by yet enough this disgusting material that is plastic, you know, unattractive, and is starting to cover counters all over America. Um, he makes these objects that, again, I find kind of unsatisfying. So this is, uh, and, I'm, and yet witty. So it's, this piece is called Expression and Impression, uh, made out of Formica. Um, they're about this big. Um, you would come up to them, and really, what would you think? They're very cold. Um, and one he's saying is really uh, expressing something, and the other is inviting an impression. But they really are very neutral, um, and yet they are art and functions are others. He then makes a painting that even lessens the variation between the delivery of these two things, and he's relying, he's saying, is there really anything different from expression and impression when you're looking at a painting? It's really much about whether you're bringing expression or impression um, and then he's again examining this area of the painting to, to bring things to us like it's some uh, hyper t um, texture, right? So we know the role by tactile engagement. So he paints something that reads absolutely as a physical three-dimensional reality where it's perfectly flat. And I think that's where the hair pieces here have a wonderful resonance in that because he found a material now that actually it is a pretty flat surface on the paper wall. It's really uh, the lowest relief of sculpture, and yet he's been able to create this three-dimensional space in it. Um, so it's again bringing together all of his uh, courses of examining. Oh, that's the empty slide. There used to be a painting on the couch there. <laughs> and then we come to the flips. So this is where the hair um, comes in in Richard's work in the late 60s. Um, he specifically was interested and stated that this hair, which originally wasn't rubberized. It was just the coarse, coarse hair that's used in stuffing furniture. Um, he liked it because it was fuzzy around the edges. So he really was trying to create a hyper sensitivity <coughs> to how we look and what we expect from art. So he makes these little dots. They first prototypes were drawings, which he turned into wooden blocks, which he then turned into horse hair. And he starts putting them everywhere. So he puts them in his and Conrad Fisher's 68, inside and outside the gallery, which is actually the place where the art is happening. Um, and he makes a, a sketch of one between those two spaces. He puts them on the campus at the University of California at Davis. And how he really sees these, and they really do function this way. Um, uh, some of us have seen them in the art world, and you've got one up on the wall in the gallery. You notice that it's really not enough of something to be really interesting. And yet it's not focused enough to be a point. So what it does is it draws your attention to everything that's around it. And so it functions really excellently. Um, Richard calls these myopic constructions. So you're actually getting that kind of focused attention into a space. And Richard's drawing your attention to the world around you, not his art. He wants you to actually engage with the world around you and to see it, to notice it, and live it. This is my favorite flip of all time. This is a pirate gypsy. We live in New York City. If anyone has ever been there knows this smokestack. And um, it stayed there for like two decades before they painted it over. So he and some friends, like, getting up, he knew someone who was like, worked there as like night security, and they got this thing up on the smokestack. So he came like, you know, look at this New York City. See it um, by noticing this crazy little dot. He then explores that in all different materials, the hardness and the, the transparency of trying to create a focal point. Um, and we were talking earlier tonight at, in the gallery, so you do notice there's this one bright orange piece in there, right? Mm -hmm. And it like, feels so differently from anything else. So in his late life, um, Richard doesn't really allow himself to use color throughout his career because color leads the viewer emotionally, right? It just completely scripts that. There couldn't be anything more joyful than that exclamation point through there. Um, and it changes the tenor of the entire room. And that, yes? 
Oh, is there something specific about that shape that you're looking for? It's the flip. On that that he, specific look, oblong flip. He experimented with it. So he really, in terms of, he, he first started off as drawings of it, and then he, if they were more dashes, and those actually were just too finite. So the oblong shape actually optically diffuses enough so that you sort of don't quite grab it with your eye. So it's really something that he, he fixed on by the process of experimentation. <coughs> by putting it in a lot of places and saying it could work that way. And other people have the same experience that he did. So, they're always going with the color. So anyway, um, so this is an addition to his actually. Oh, those were the five pair boxes, but they're not here either. Um, they are um, five different shapes. Actually, it's really great to have one. You don't need my slide. Here's one of those pair boxes over there. So, um, Richard experiments with making a bunch of different things that aren't quite solid that, with this hair material. Um, one thing about hair, if any of you, you know, I'm actually curated to show what hair was. And it really is like the quintessential you know, fetishization kind of an object. It's really, you, know, you respond viscerally to it. Um, and it can be really creepy, but it can be so sensual. And, um, I think Richard really started to like it, not just for the fact that it was fuzzy, but I think he actually thought it sort of comes to represent the fetishization, I will not say that again, of seeing for him, right? It really is an obsession in art, to see. And so it's like this perfect marriage, um, being obsessed with visuality. Um, here's just a nice piece that he made in the early 70s that's like a catalog of all the materials that he works with, like all of the fakeness. So, and one of the earliest boxes he ever made with that white formica was a box that was coated on the outside with that, and um, and was beautiful, beautiful wood on the inside. Um, so it's sort of framed in the art of this. But I like the way that he actually sees this as a way, he can pull out a drawer and goes, I'm gonna do the world in rubber today. And do that, and then I'm gonna formica eyes my ideas today. Um, Richard continues to be obsessed. Um, he moves into using a, more of a bristle type, um, which is uh, what the exclamation point is, but making utterly ridiculous and friendly things that are nothing, um, like this brush flip, which is absolutely a fantastic object. It's about this big. And it's like a little animal, um, and it's not really functional. You couldn't put it on the floor. It's not that big of an animal, but it's a little oversized for on top of a table. So it really, again, it's like this non-functional being in the world. It really is an art object. And uh, we actually have one. If you haven't seen it, there's one almost hidden in, uh, in a corner. Oh, great. Oh, good, good, good. All right, go find it. Yeah, <laughs> um, Richard, again, is an artist process, uh, informs all of his thinking. Um, he's drawn extensively throughout his life. In the mid-70s, he began a series of taking some very ordinary things that are in his life, the basket, the table, the one with the up, and he draws this vast series of like uh, over 50 drawings, um, actually half of which has been lost, which is really tragic, of examining the relationships of those objects to each other, creating hybrid objects, and putting them in, in a room in a way to see how they look and how we feel in response to them. And he then begins to make objects that actually do that and painting. So we have this very neutral kind of, again, cold painting, right? Black and white on the Celotex. Um, in the 80s, you'll be amused to learn. So the Celotex was this great neutral material so that Richard didn't have to be responsible. They stopped making it. So actually, he now manufactures his own Celotex in order to paint on it, which is just like a really perfect irony that he's been driven back into the loving arms of being the creative art maker or artist. Um, making his surfaces, it's all very laborious, and that's the thing we're going to love, is those beautiful celotex surfaces someday. So he's making his own celotex. Um, and he also makes most of all of the frames for his paintings as well. Um, but he, again, in this like kind of cold space of observation, this other room, he examines these objects in a very kind of clinical uh, way. And it's a, oh, a room of his imagination, actually. It's a way to sort of see something farther away from his immediate context. 
Um, and then he explores how they might fit into the world in other weird ways. And again, these are like really incredibly weird objects. Like, what would you make a, a pyramid, a rolling a basket, a window, a floor? Um, but he wanted to three dimensionalize them and be confronted by them physically in the room. Um, he then makes paintings where he's really immersed in them. They become bigger than you. Again, the tactility of them becomes bigger than you. And he starts at this point to introduce that color again. Richard greatly admires that painter Bonard. And um, one of the really beautiful things that was given to me this summer is in his studio, um, for the first time, I saw these very early drawings he did as a young man of the desert in Mexico. And he's now making the same drawings now. There's a real pendants in how he's been seeing the world and loved the world, and he's closing the chapter on how he's experienced and seeing that world now. So he's um, enabled himself to go back to using color. Um, again, like the, we were talking earlier, that really crazy odd piece of the place settings on the built-in bench that's in the, made out of course here over here. A lot of his recent paintings have been uh, addressing the, image, the intimate space of his lived workspace with his wife. They have a wonderful relationship, um, but it's a very small and intimate world. He's obviously, previous in his life, he's had a very big world at age often diminishes the, the scope of your experience. And these objects and things are becoming much more um, ever-present. They're kind of ominous in a way. Um, and yet there's a brightness and a beauty in them. And so there's color has come back into the paintings. He's allowing himself to experience that color. I think he really physically was raised with it, right? He grew up in New Mexico. Color has been important to him. These colors are rich blues and uh, siennas. And um, Bonard, if you know him, uh, or his work, late 19th century French painter, uh, painted it with a beautiful palette. He's, not, he's known as really one of the most extraordinary colorists. Um, and he sort of, uh, so, kind of, just a really remarkable painting. It's a beautiful show from that last year. Anyway, um, but his world was very small. He lived he had an invalided wife, and they lived in a house. And she's in all of these scenes of the rooms. But you often can't see her because she's like molting, you know, sort of melting into the bathtub or melting into the wall piece. And um, in a sense, Richard's now doing his own variation on that world. Um, for him, I think I'm like, oh, it's a happy world. But still, that kind of intimacy, if you're in a relationship, is fairly intimidating, right? You know, if you were with your, your beloved person 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that's a lot of accountability, right? That's a lot of uh, consciousness. Um, and that's, those are negative terms, but that's, that's an intensity. It's very real, and um, he's uh, painting that world. I hope some of you got to meet his wife, Anna, and she's here. She's a lovely person. He calls her. She's his, she's his light, actually. So. Um, again, he continues to make sculptural objects and then explore the space of the world, the wall, the art world. Um, but more and more, they sort of fold into the issues of space and time. And I think this piece, I picked this slide because I think this very beautifully exemplifies. And going back to, remember how that very first chest was painted with that black and white um, skein? Um, and this time, it's really conveying to us a sense of speed and a projection through space. And it comes into the crack of the wall and becomes the hard and flat surface of an image again. So um, again, accounting for I you know, sort of think of that as actually a molecular concept of how the world is constructed, and that's where I could do more research on what he was thinking about when he was studying uh, science and biology. But I do, in, in his conversation, he actually does frequently talk about the connectedness of human beings with the world. But what he says about human beings, how we're privileged, actually, if you can get it online, look up, he wrote an essay called Art and Reason. And he says what, how human beings are privileged is actually in addition to our immediate experience of the world, we always can bring memory to bear on our present experience. And, and that's where he, um, in a sense, as an artist, has tried to stay out of the way of our experiences coming to these objects. In fact, that's why the gray and white sort of wants our experience to put the color into them, our emotions to put the feeling and the understanding into them. So, um, to the rubber pieces. This is, you know, out of all the rubber pieces I can pick to show, like, did I pick the one that's not here? Yes, thank you very much. 
Um, but again, he exemplifies very well the kind of hyper-flattened space that's completely three-dimensional. So um, this piece um, is, a, a, again, harder to read in terms of that complex three-dimensionality, but it's really kind of remarkable that he's able to create such a sense of sculptural experience that literally, um, what was that quote that I said about well, the picture? You could touch an object you could, no, no a sculpture you could touch. Sculpture you could see. Sculpture you could see, the teacher you could touch. See, they're completely holding together. And then lastly, I bring back the baby picture to a picture that's now in, in Richard's studio. This painting is Generation 3, 2003. He's still living with it. It's immediately, it's something he's not let go, which means it's really good. And he's very few um, paintings in his home. And it's a picture of a baby being born. And there could be nothing less akin than these two images, which are at the beginning and the end of his career. And um, I, I find it a highly disturbing painting, actually. Um, but there's no real reason I can walk into why that is so, except that um, it's, it's at a distance from my understanding what this image is. Why would he make this image? What is the intent? It's clearly you know, an unfettered uh, birth of a child. You know, Child has just been born. It actually should be a very hopeful and promising image. And um, I'm much more comfortable with, with the artist representing something of life in the world than my being challenged to um, bring to bear my emotional experience and afraid of what might be connected to it. And um, I think Richard has come to understand that in life, it, it does remain, um, in many ways, our experience is still intangible. That, um, that's the mystery of living. And he's being very honest about that in terms of this representation. And, um, and it's fun to actually see the two different cell attacks at this point. Um, but that, um, that we want art to give us an answer, and Richard Art's father's work, um, he's never settled into that. I think as we see in our history, time will give us more answers from his work. Um, and um, in a sense, I really firmly believe by the practice and by my reaction to it, that he's a little ahead of our time. And um, that he's an amazing artist. And, um, these are hard and complicated objects. So they're giving us a little bit more than we want, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, those are my thoughts tonight. I'm um, happy to answer questions here if I can. And then if you have questions about things to show, we can talk about them there as well. Biographical information, I, I didn't have to tell anyone off that trail, but people are always interested. So Richard's making furniture in New York, and he sends out 12 letters. Like if you're artists in the audience, you know of the story. He sends out 12 letters to dealers in New York saying, I make those weird, like, Formica sculptures. And I sent some pictures. And of course, no one wrote back, except for one guy, whose name was Ivan Park. Many of you know. The art world, Ivan Park was working with Leo Castelli in 1963, and Ivan Park said, I like your work, and Leo gave him a show that year. And he had this then, he went from being this guy who was completely off the map to being an internationally known art figure, and had a career that, you know, all of the energy that he put to making that beautiful furniture of the year, he had to get on the, the ticket to make art for the incredible New York career that he then had in the years and years. So, kind of an amazing Um, his answers to that, <coughs> interviewers, <coughs> interviewers have always asked you, so you're a pop artist, right? And, um, and he says, if you're an art critic and you say that, I guess that could be true. Because um, this is our critics make their own, um, make the narrative of the art world. Um, but <coughs> he actually, you know, he respected some of those artists, he saw their work, um, but I really think he just made his own. And I think that's what's fascinating about him, is because he's not connected to John's and Ashford. He's seen what they're doing, but it's clear when you know the history that his, the world he's making is completely comes out of his experience. He has a certain capacity with uh, experiencing the visual culture and um, the physical world, and he's trying to make that more immediate for himself and his life. And um, he's 
not interested in broader culture. He's not making objects that are being reproduced in um, you know, advertisements, consumerism. He's making the, the chair that's in the next term in the studio. He's making them grow and it's better. So it's that world that he really wants to know because he spends his whole life time. He did, oh, there's my the son little tidbit. Um, that interviewers are, like, I'm trying to know the team was, right? Because I think we didn't care less. But um, in the early 60s, he's working as a furniture maker. Klaus Oldenburg makes that, um, for the Whitney, this uh, bedroom installation. And Richard makes all the furniture for that. So, um, and Klaus like, wow, that furniture you make is really cool. You know, let's make an installation. And they have a perfectly fine relationship that mm -hmm. wasn't a car horse thing. It's actually like Klaus Salzburg. So Which I like because it's like um, that again poses that big question about you know so much art about artists today is fabricated by someone else. <clears throat> so there are very few instances where a decorative artist is making high art where there's collaborations in a sense. Um, it's usually somebody's got the idea, someone that they find somebody to make it for them. And really weirdly, you know, talk about this. I'm actually simultaneously with this show working on a show about a French frame maker. Bunch of other amazing artists and made really incredibly framed and um, actually collaborative painting sculptures. So I guess I'm obsessed with this. Uh, will this uh, retrospective travel? <clears throat> We're working on that. <laughs> there are a number of institutions that are interested, so um, we're going to see who the matches are. We're trying to make it across America. Um, we definitely, Richard is very sentimental about Chicago. Um, so he lived in New Mexico, his very early life was in Washington, but every uh, year when he went to college, he, from Cornell out to New Mexico, he stopped in Chicago and went to the Art Institute. He was very emotional. Um, and of course, all of us were trying to do what so the Richard was in the show. I heard he loved being here. He's still game to travel. He's a pretty amazing person. So, and he's still working every day. But we're, you know, he's, he's had to stop lifting new cheese and fly with this. It wasn't so good for him earlier. 